we've seen in the in the coming weeks since since this has happened we've seen france put its security alert state up to the highest possible level we've seen italy just do that um as well in the last in the last uh, day or so now you only put your security alert up to the highest possible level if you've got intelligence to suggest that there is a high probability of an attack on on your soil and it, it's all intelligence based um uk hasn't done yet germany is considering closing its borders down. Um, Belgium is also looking at, at different measures uh, and whether they need to increase their alert states. But it's, you know, I, I think ISIS and Al-Qaeda have seen the way the world is focused very much on the destabilization that's going on in, in different places and are seeing a bit of a vacuum in the security organizations that are looking at them from a counterterrorism perspective. And, and it's the perfect way to, to try and exploit that. Russia has always been on their, their target list um, and we're always on the target list as well. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio. I'm James Hansen. And today we're once again talking about the latest on the war in Ukraine with former Colonel Philip Ingram, MBE. Philip is a regular guest here on Frontline. He's a former military intelligence officer with more than 26 years of experience in the UK Armed Forces and a former NATO planner. He's now a military analyst and commentator. Philip, always a pleasure. Welcome back to Frontline. Nice to be back, James. Uh, I wanted to start by getting your reaction to the atrocity last week at this concert hall in Moscow. Of course, Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin have baselessly blamed Ukraine and the West more broadly without any evidence. Is that simply a tactic designed to deflect blame towards Putin? Because it seems to me that there would be significant blame towards Putin and, and the Kremlin more generally for what is clearly a very significant security failure. Well, the Russians have got a doctrine called Maskarovka, which is all about masking. It's all about putting something out there to try and throw people off the scent or give them believable alternatives um, so that you're, you're not allowing the full truth to come out. You know, in reality, the Russians should be embarrassed because the, the Americans had given them uh, due warning a couple of weeks ago um, saying that they had identified um, a specific threat um, against a public place or uh, in their wording that actually said concert and they'd put a ban out on any Americans at attending or suggested Americans don't attend um, open air events and concerts um, in Moscow um, and, and across Russia. So they, they clearly had credible intelligence. They thought it was going to be that specific weekend but um, it, it happened a couple of weeks later. The Russians dismissed the American intelligence um, as, as they do a lot of the time. Um, and then this, this attack occurred. It almost certainly was um, ISIS inspired. Um, and it's come to highlight not just to um, the Russians, but highlight to all of us, actually, that whilst we're focusing on the war in Ukraine, the destabilization in the Middle East, what China's up to in, in Southeast Asia, that actually ISIS, and I will expand that to Al Qaeda, are still out there and they're still looking for um, opportunistic attacks. And what are some of the questions we still don't have answers to about the events of Friday night? Well, there's there's a number that have come out. You know, the the ISIS group that claimed responsibility are I, ISIS K. Now, ISIS K are ISIS, um, and the K is for uh, Khorasan. Now, Khorasan is a province in Afghanistan on the Afghan uh, Pakistan border. It's historically an old region of what we now describe as Afghanistan. That's there. They used to be very um, uh, regionally focused in that particular area because they grew out of um, a group that was based in Pakistan. So you, they've carried out a lot, an awful lot of attacks in uh, in Afghanistan itself, uh, but they have international ambitions. So this would fit with potentially with their international ambitions and suggest that they've they've got this capability. ISIS itself has been focused on um, Russia for a number of years. You, we had the 2015. Um, downing of um, a Russian airliner in Egypt with 224 people dying. We had in um, uh, 2017 uh, the attack in um, uh, there, there was an attack in Russia, leaving 15 dead in St. Petersburg on the, on the metro that's there. Um, and you know, Russia is heavily involved in fighting ISIS with Bashar al-Assad in Syria um, and elsewhere. So th they're you know, th they're not seen as a popular country in the same way that most Western countries are not seen as a popular country by ISIS and Al-Qaeda and other Islamist affiliated terror organizations. And so that's what's had them up as a target. But 
there are a number of questions. You know, you know, to my mind, I don't understand why it took so long for the Russian security forces to respond. You know, there were armed security guards in the actual concert establishment, and they seemed to just stay in their in their office, and they had semi-automatic weapons. Um, the uh, Russian police and, and federal security are literally minutes away. It took them 90 minutes to respond and get into the building. So what's going on there? Um, I, I don't really know. And Putin has been scrambling around to try and find some form of link to throw out um, and suggest that Ukraine had some involvement in this somewhere. Um, that probably ties in with uh, some of his wider policies. And as I say, it's part of that, that Maskarovka game that he is playing. What what do you think could be the potential explanations for those delays? I mean, was it simply incompetence or could it be something more sinister? Well, I, I think incompetence is, is the most likely and therefore that's probably what it was. Um, but there, you, there, there could be something more sinister behind it in that um, you, there, there, there could be something that uh, would see Russian um, federal security, the FSB, you know, having stimulated the potential for an attack somewhere that they could um, then use to... Um, try and blame the Ukrainians and use as an excuse for an escalation in uh, recruiting more people into the military and and, and clamping down on on things th throughout throughout Russia itself. The Americans releasing the intelligence to say that they'd picked up a specific threat and all the rest of it could have easily been a warning into um, the uh, Russian intelligence to say we know what you're up to, folks. Uh, in doing this. Uh, and that's something that US intelligence agencies and UK intelligence agencies have been doing much more of, releasing secret intelligence um, into the public domain by way of a warning to um, uh, the Russians in particular that we know what you're doing. And they've done that on a, on a couple of occasions beforehand to try and um, stop the Russians from carrying out the activities that, they, that they've done. But I'm purely speculating here. You know, it is it is most likely it is you know an ISIS inspired um, uh, attack. It uh, it was um, uh, incompetence by the security forces, and that's why we've seen the brutality that have come out of the Russian security forces um, whenever they've they've captured these individuals and interrogated them. It does strike me as highly surprising that not just the Kremlin but a lot of sort of pro Kremlin military bloggers have been so dismissive of ISIS K and so determined to put the blame on. The West and on Ukraine, there was one uh, ultra-nationalist military blogger who I think essentially described ISIS-K as being little more than a media outlet these days, which seems to be incredibly complacent. Why is that? And, and what are the security risks involved there? Because if that is genuinely their attitude towards ISIS-K, surely they're opening themselves up to a huge security risk. They are very much so. Um, and that security risk hasn't gone away. You know, the, the fact that there haven't been a large number of attacks suggests just how... Um, short of resources and short of capability ISIS-K and other um, Islamist terror groups ha have got, but it doesn't stop them looking at um, the, the potential. And we've seen in the in the coming weeks since, since this has happened, we've seen France put its security alert state up to the highest possible level. We've seen Italy just do that um, as well in the last in the last uh, day or so. Now, you only put your security alert up to the highest possible level if you've got intelligence to suggest that there is a high probability of an attack on, on your soil. And it, it's all intelligence based. Um, UK hasn't done yet. Germany is considering closing its borders down. Um, Belgium is also looking at, at different measures uh, and whether they need to increase their alert states. But it's, you know, I, I think ISIS and Al Qaeda have seen the way the world is focused very much on the destabilization that's going on in, in different places and are seeing a bit of a vacuum in the security organizations that are looking at them from a counterterrorism perspective. And, and it's the perfect way to, to try and exploit that. Russia has always been on their, their target list um, and we're always on the target list as well. Do you think Vladimir Putin genuinely believes that Ukraine and the West had some involvement? Is he believing his own propaganda now? Is he high on his own supply? Well, it's interesting. I, I think I think Putin believes a lot of what he's being fed. You know, Putin's kept inside a bubble, um, and therefore it's those immediately around him that feed what goes into him and take what what comes out from him. So they they can influence the way he's thinking by restricting the amount of information uh, or making sure the information goes into him in a certain way. Um, you know, the, the chairman of the Russian National Security Council, um, Petrushchev, is probably the chief of staff. He's probably the most powerful man. He is the gatekeeper and controls what goes into Vladimir Putin and what comes out from Vladimir Putin. 
Um, so Putin will have been fed the line that uh, they were trying to escape to Ukraine. They'd, they'd got an escape route through there, when in reality, I think they were trying to get to Belarus um, uh, and, 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 and looking, at, looking at that. Uh, he will be fed the line that Western intelligence was involved, because it had to be, because the Americans had pre-warned this two weeks ago, um, and that, that would fit with what he wants to get out in the narrative. Because what I think we're seeing Putin doing, now that he's been re-elected, he will see this as a mandate for him to um, up the stakes in what's going on inside Ukraine and try and break the stalemate that he's got. Um, and therefore, anything that he can do to target the Russian people in the way he's saying things from an information perspective to set the conditions to enable that to happen is what he's doing. And that's why we're seeing all of these wild claims coming out that it was you know, MI6, the CIA and others that helped plan this and, and get um, you know, the, the, these militants involved. But there's so much direct intelligence that you know this was um uh, you know uh, radicals that had, that had, that had come in that putin has had to very clearly say that he thinks it is it is them but he's trying to stitch something else in just to make a bigger picture let's come on philip to the latest situation in ukraine i mean on the front line again it's this positional warfare we've been seeing for months russia making a few more confirmed advances around avdivka Ukraine trying to cross the Dnieper and establish more bridgeheads. What, what is your reading of what we're seeing at the moment? The, the, the front line, in reality, has stalled. You know, there's, there's not there's not much going on from the Russian perspective. It's because you know, they they're throwing lots of manpower at, at things, but that manpower is getting decimated. Russians are still losing between eight hundred and a thousand troops a day, twenty plus armored vehicles a day, you know, twenty artillery pieces a day. Um, you know, the, the, therefore, the front lines are, are static um, and Ukraine hasn't got the ability to start to push Russia back. Russia's making very small advances. And when I say small, you're talking of 50 metres, 100 metres um, in, in different places, but it's costing them two, three, four thousand dead to, to get those 100 metres. This is this is first world war type attritional warfare. Um, uh, in, in reality, if you examine it over the um, the hundreds of kilometres that the, the front line's on, it's, it's I'd describe it as stalemate. Where the real war is going on at the moment um, uh, and where Ukraine seems to have the resources to do this is in, in depth, the war in depth um, and the war at the, at the operational level. So we're seeing Ukraine using its um, storm shadow um, and scalp um, cruise missiles that have been supplied by uh, UK and France to good effect. Um, and they've effectively uh, taken another big chunk out of the Black Sea Fleet, destroying the Black Sea Fleet communications headquarters, damaging um, another couple of ships in port um, and sinking another two large landing craft. Um, you know, I think we're probably up to 50 percent of the Russian Black Sea Fleet um, being sunk um, or damaged beyond repair by a country that doesn't have a real naval capability. And that's phenomenal. And, and the repercussions of that sending back um, uh, because a lot of that fleet was needed to move logistics around uh, to, to resupply the Russian front line. They're now relying very much on um, the Kirsch Bridge, which is uh, extremely vulnerable. Uh, and uh, Vladimir Putin has got a new railway line being built into the area from Russia to try and, to try and get supplies down. But railway lines take time to build and get in, and then they're, they're very vulnerable. Um, and whilst Ukraine's doing that, it's then continuing to attack Russian oil refineries. And it's not just attacking them and attacking the, the storage sites and all the rest of it. It's attacking the, um, the distilling, the, 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 the fraction towers, and it's attacking the power supplies into, into the oil refineries and effectively putting them out of action for what will be a minimum of months, if not longer. Um, and that is having a, a, a huge economic impact on Russia's ability to sell oil products around the world. Um, and that will have a, an ability on Russia's ability to um, uh, continue to finance what it's doing. So this is, you know, the Ukrainians are being very clever in, in what they're attacking here. And, and, and therefore, they're, I describe it as they're hollowing the Russian defences out from behind. Now, this is a long, slow activity, but no matter how strong your defensive wall is at the front, if you undermine its foundations and you hollow it out from behind, at some stage that wall will collapse. But it's a long, slow effort. Um, in 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 doing it, um, and it's attriting Russia in areas where it's it's even more difficult for them to build up their their military capability. They can't build ships quickly. Um, the Ukrainians have been hitting more aircraft either in the air. They've been um, carrying out 
um, uh, anti-air ambushes with um, German Patriot missile batteries, and they've also, with the, the Scalp and Storm Shadow missiles, damaged a number of Russian aircraft on the ground and airfields. Um, that takes a long time for the, the Russians to be able to rebuild that capability, especially when they are under such heavy sanctions for um, the technologies that are needed to put in new aircraft. So Russia is um, hurting at the moment, and the Ukrainians are doing a fantastic job. And it's your General Badanov, the head of Ukrainian military intelligence, that is leading all of these operations. And of course, we've we've had the um, incursion of the Russian forces, or the, the Russian nationals that are fighting with the Ukrainian forces into the Belgorod area. Um, and you know, they're still in there. Now, I haven't heard what's happened to them over the last two or three days, but I still think they're they're in and holding parts of Russian territory, which is you know, embarrassing Vladimir Putin, mm-hmm. embarrassing Petrushchev, um, and, and Putin is getting quite quite riled. And we're seeing that in some of his reactions with, you know, large numbers of Russian crews or ballistic missiles um, and uh, Iranian supplied drones targeting civilian infrastructure and targeting military infrastructure um, into, into Ukraine. And uh, Ukraine is you're not having the sort of 90 plus percent success in shooting them down that it's it's had up until now, but it's still getting a good 70 or 80 percent um, of, them, of, them, of them shot down before they hit the targets. It was interesting that you said, I, th- I think you said that 50 percent, you reckon, now the Black Sea fleet has been destroyed or there or thereabouts. I mean, previously we've heard this figure of maybe about a third or just over a third has been destroyed. But if it is half of the Black Sea fleet now destroyed, I mean, that is a landmark moment. And then how long would it take, do you think, Philip, until potentially the entire Black Sea fleet is destroyed? Well, you know, the 50 percent is, 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 a, is a bit of you know, figuring it out in the back of my head. Um, whenever we're talking of a third, um, that didn't include the two large landing ships that that um, have been confirmed um, sunk and then reports coming in today of another two ships being being damaged so another four ships is is, is getting is getting that uh, tending towards 50% is 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 how I'd probably put it more accurately um it's causing the russian black sea fleet uh, to to stop its operations, you know, it it was trying to threaten the grain supplies that were going out from Odessa um, to resupply the rest of the world, the grain and the cooking oil and all the rest of it. Uh, Ukraine can now uh, continue its supplies. In fact, the the volumes of um, foodstuffs that are going out have have got bigger than uh, you know, pre-war times uh, as they're getting it out, and the Russians can't do anything about it. So it's effectively rendered what the Black Sea Fleet has been doing. Um, uh, you know, useless or, or, or neutralized it as a threat. The other thing the Black Sea Fleet was doing is um, uh, being laun- being sent out to launch um, cruise missiles and um, you know, attack into uh, Ukrainian cities. It's been limited very much in what it can do with that because you know the protection. The, the, it's been proved that they the ships can't protect themselves, and the Ukrainians are watching for any opportunity. So it's militarily embarrassing. It's politically embarrassing, and effectively, it's rendered the Russian Black Sea Fleet um, not able to carry out the mission that uh, Putin wanted to carry out. And that's why we've seen, I think, two changes of commanders of the Black Sea Fleet um, in recent months, um, and we'll and we'll see more. Um, so you know, they they. Their ability to contribute to what's going on inside Ukraine has been you know, virtually neutralized, um, and uh, we're we're seeing the Ukrainians now um, you know, continuing to take on the Russian air force um, and the Russian army in similar ways with these special operations executive type operations um, that are having you know, a huge success. You mentioned General Badanov uh, a moment ago, Philip. I wanted to ask about a different general, General Sersky, because we're about two months now from when he replaced General Zeluzhny as Ukraine's military commander in chief. Have we seen any significant tactical or strategic shifts since that transition? I don't think we've seen anything, um, but I, I'm not surprised. It's really difficult taking over that sort of role um, you know, in the middle in the middle of a conflict. Not unusual, but it, but it's difficult. And he doesn't have any additional resources. You know, he he hasn't got. He's still waiting for a lot of ammunition to come in from the west. He's still waiting for a lot of um, Western troops. The ground is not in a good position for manoeuvre warfare. For uh, you employing uh, heavy Western armour to go and attack in, into the Russian positions and all the rest of it. Um, so, I, I would I would hope that what he's doing is he's building up his reserves and. 
um, you know, supporting what's going on on the front line to keep it um, as as steady uh, as it possibly can. But we've seen very little from them, um, and that. It depends his personality. He he never struck me as someone who was getting um, massively engaged in, in everything that's going on publicly. So from that perspective, I'm not surprised we're not hearing things from him. Um, but I'd have expected a little bit more. But time will tell. Um, the spring, late spring, is when I'd expect to see something coming out. Um, if nothing's happened by then, I then start to get worried. And looking ahead to the late spring, do you think there is any prospect of a, a significant Ukrainian counteroffensive this year? I know a couple of months ago, a lot of analysts were pretty pessimistic and said, well, look, in, until there is, hopefully at some point very soon, the, the US military aid gets approved and actually ends up in Ukraine. It is unrealistic to expect any significant counteroffensive. Is that still your view? There, there needs to be um, a, an increase in the amount of ammunition and equipment that the Ukrainians have got. Um, they're getting their, their personnel trained. You know, the UK is leading a multinational um, force training um, you know, tens of thousands of, of Ukrainian troops. Uh, and, and other NATO countries are, are doing the same um, uh, in their, their, their home countries. But it's bringing in not just the equipment and the trained personnel to use them, but it's the sufficient ammunition stocks so that once they begin um, a counteroffensive, they can sustain it. Um, and I think lessons have been learned over the, over the last year as to exactly what that means. And without the US support, I think it would be very difficult potentially for them to sustain it. And even with the US support, um, one thing that has been found wanting across the whole of the West is, yes, we've got our stocks of ammunition, but what we didn't have was the manufacturing capacity to bring those stocks back up again once they were used and used at the attritional rates that we're seeing inside Ukraine. That's taking time to build up. Now, um, it's beginning to come online and will come online towards the end of this year um, and later in and uh, later into next year, uh, we'll be able to get up into being able to produce the millions of shells that, that are needed. But that's something that has, has I think, shocked the West and then we're seeing you know, some EU countries and, and NATO countries being quite innovative and in finding um, stocks of uh, ammunition in, around the world. And they're just putting finance packages together to go and buy that um, and bring it in. There's, there's 800,000 shells, um, 155 millimeter and 122 millimeter being, being delivered as we speak on a, a project that, that I think was started by the Czechs um, as they go through. Um, and and you know, that will keep the Ukrainians in a position where they can continue to hold the Russians, whether it gives them the ability to um, actually prosecute and start to push them back this year, I don't know. Because the other bit that needs to come in is um, control of the airspace. You know, the Russians over the last year have had control of the airspace without having um, complete control of it. Um, the Ukrainians are having some success in shooting Russian aircraft down. We're waiting for the um, the Western S-16s to come in, but it's not just the S-16 as, as an aircraft, it's the weapon systems that come with it will allow the Ukrainians then potentially to generate small areas of local air superiority. If they can do that, that gives cover to the ground forces, that lets the ground forces exploit it. But again, there's no point in doing that unless you've got the supplies of um, the weapons and the ammunition that's needed to do that. So that will be occupying their planners very much at the moment. And, and whether 2024 is another year of um, a, a counteroffensive attempt or whether they're going to postpone that into 2025, um, it's difficult to tell at the moment. Philip, it was interesting you mentioned about the Czechs and, and how they're trying to acquire more shells and, and get them somehow to the front line in Ukraine. Can you just tell us a, a bit more about that? Well, there's... Um, uh, the, the 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 Czech leader, who's a, a you know a, f a former general, um, you know, had got his team looking around the world to try and identify where there are countries that there would be stocks of ammunition. Um, now, some of these countries um, wouldn't necessarily want to supply directly to Ukraine, but they're more than happy to sell the ammunition through a third party. Um, and I think you know, some of the stocks probably sit in um, Southeast Asia. You, you know, South Korea has got huge stocks of. Uh, of, of ammunition elsewhere. I'm not saying that they're they're part of the part of the suppliers, but they could be. You know, India, Pakistan, and and other countries will will have supplies. They won't want to be seen to be supplying directly, uh, but would potentially do it through through a third party. So they brought an international. They, they worked out how much it will cost. They brought an international coalition together to raise that money and to go and buy it, and then you know, get get it supplied into Ukraine. Um, meanwhile, that gives a little bit of respite then for. Um, the Americans to try and get through their political hiatus 
well, it's not really a political hiatus. It's one person, uh, the Speaker of the House, that's holding it all up. Um, he, he's being influenced, I think, by Donald Trump, who probably wants to come in at some stage during the election process and say, hey, I've got a word with a few people. I've solved it. Um, and, and try and do that to make to make him look good. But in the meantime, Ukrainians are paying for that hiatus with you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lives every day. Um, and then it also buys the time for, as I said, the Western defense industrial base mm. to increase its capacity, which is something that will only improve our wider security um, and is something that um, we need to happen. Do you sense that the West collectively is starting to to get it in terms of the need to ramp up defense production. You know, you, you hear now conversations around the percentage of spending that we're going to need, you know, to put towards defense and that, and that countries do need to increase their defense contributions in a way that for recent decades, you know, it, it simply hasn't been on that scale. Do, do you sense we're almost at a tipping point now, Philip? I, I think some nations have got it and, and they're, they're, they're spending and they're spending their money very wisely. Um, the UK's got one of the biggest budgets, but it's not spending its money wisely at all. Um, I think the other nations that are uh, making all the right noises are scared, and they're scared because of the potential for Donald Trump to come in. You know, Donald Trump has turned around and said that you know, the US would pull out of NATO um, if uh, NATO contributing countries weren't um, spending the two percent that they'd signed up to, you know, uh, I think his lines were, you know, if you don't pay your bills, you know, why should we support you? Sort of, sort of, sort of thing. Um, and that is scaring different nations because they have relied on security from the United States for for um, for such a long time, and the United States has you know, delivered uh, on 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 every occasion. Now, there's only ever been one Article Five. Um, operation called, and that was called with the United States after the 9-11 attack, and NATO came to support the United States into operations into Afghanistan um, that for its first couple of years stopped Afghanistan being a uh, an area that Al-Qaeda could exploit for training purposes and launching terror attacks around the world. The operation then um, went into mission creep and it became a complete disaster after that. But the first two years, it achieved its aims. Uh, and And Trump coming in I'm not a Trump fan in any way, shape or form, but he uses his bully boy tactics to turn around to those nations that have not traditionally spent 2% of the GDP on defence uh, and, and are forcing them to do that. From a, a wider defence perspective, that can only be a good thing. A good thing, not just for our collective defence, but also a good thing for our collective economies. Because if that money is spent, you know, it's spent in our own countries where... Um, it's our own manufacturing capabilities that, that are there. Defense products tend to be manufactured in your own country. So it's it's turning taxpayers' um, dollars, euros, pounds back into your, your own economy, creating jobs, creating more taxpayers, um, creating uh, supporting industries uh, and all the rest of it. So economically, that's quite a good thing to do. And it's interesting because, you know, the old adage in, in UK politics certainly is there are no votes in defense. But it will be interesting in an election year in the UK whether both major parties are pledging an increase in defence spending in their manifesto. Well, yeah, it's 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 interesting. You know, the the debates have been going on. You know, the Secretary for Defence has come out and said that you know he he thinks there should be an increase now. Um, but then uh, you know, other ministers come in and say, yes, we need there to be an increase. And the government's got this. We'll increase to 2.5% when the economic conditions um, are, are, are there. Uh, and they're saying, yes, it's our ambition to do that, but only when we can sustain it. Um, and it should, you know, it should go up to, I think it should go up to 3% or more. Um, however, I also do think that the Ministry of Defence needs to be held to account um, and learn how to spend our money more wisely. You know, the, the, the Polish defence budget is significantly less than the UK defence budget, and the Poles are just buying 900 main battle tanks. Once we have transitioned from Challenger 2 to Challenger 3, we will have 143 or 148, less than 150 main battle tanks. You know, the, the Poles will have um, you know, eight or 900 or more um, artillery pieces. We'll have 200. Um, you know, and, and our budget's bigger. Now, a big chunk of our budget goes off in the nuclear deterrent, but it's not that much that goes off in the nuclear deterrent. So we need to learn how to spend our money much more wisely um, to get the military capability that we need. And we're going to need more troops. But again, Minister of Defence can't recruit to the numbers that it's allowed to recruit to at the moment. Um, and it needs to 
you get that sorted out. And part of that's down to the fact that they've given you know, a multi-billion pound contract to um, a company to do the recruiting for them. Uh, and they're now having to turn around and put service personnel into the recruiting offices to back up what they've already you know, contracted that company to do. And there's no accountability whatsoever. That's just writing off more and more and more taxpayers' money. And it's not just the UK. This is happening uh, in other places. But the UK is one of the worst uh, at wastage that there is in defence. So we need more money, but defence needs to learn how to spend it more wisely so that we get a, a much better bang for our bucks. Philip Ingram, it's always a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us today on Frontline. Thank you. Thank you for watching Frontline for Times Radio. For more, click subscribe on our YouTube channel. You can listen to Times Radio and you can read more about the war in Ukraine and global security with your Times digital subscription.